Lake Shore, if you did not get a bulletin when you came in, just raise your hand now as the ushers pass by. They'll be glad to give you one. In that bulletin, there's a sermon outline to follow along with and take notes on. You can also, if you have your smartphone or tablet and have version, you can log into our live event there and get your notes there. Uh, search by our zip code, 37013. We are glad that you're here. Lots of good things going on at Lakeshore. I want to remind you, I've got a new Lakeshore 101 class that will be starting the first Wednesday night in March. It'll be Wednesday nights, March the 6th through the 27th. If you've not been through Lakeshore 101, I would encourage you to go through that class at least one time, even if you've been here at Lakeshore for a long time. It will help you get a better feel and picture uh, and understanding of who we are as a church, what our vision is, what our what our uh, heart is as a church, what it is we're trying to do to let God use us to be his church here in this place. Wednesday nights at 6.30, you can sign up on our website, lakeshorechristian.com, or you can sign up out at the information counter. You can just leave your name and uh, phone and email there, and we'll be glad to make sure we get you enrolled for that class. We need to know how many to prepare for, so we want you to register in advance if you can. We also want to thank you for bringing your, we are collecting tuna, canned tuna and tuna helper uh, for the food bank, the area food bank that we're partnering with some others to help start in this area. And I I ask you to fill up at least those four boxes out there. And I checked this morning and they are full and overflowing. So thank you so much for that. That does not mean, however, we can't actually take more donations. We still can take more, but I wanted to at least get that much. But if you'd still like to bring some donations to help out with that, we will encourage you to go ahead and do that over the next week here. As we prepare now for our message time, I want us to uh, go to God in prayer. I'm sure that you've got needs within your own uh, individual lives or family situations. And I want us to, uh, again, one of those things we can do together is pray for one another, lift each other up uh, together as a body of Christ. So as I pray out loud, I would like for you to be praying silently for your brothers and sisters in Christ here today. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We come individually but we also come corporately as the family of God here at Lakeshore we know within this church family there are many church needs there are many individuals families circumstances opportunities challenges that face the people that belong to this church family but father we know none of those things is beyond you you are over all of these things you are the one who has all authority and all ability to provide exactly what's needed So we ask for wisdom and discernment so that we can make the right choices. We can walk the way you want us to walk and be within your will because we know that it's within your will that we can claim your promises and your blessings, your care, your provision for our lives. Thank you, Father, for being so faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Walk This Way, the series that we're in right now, we're going through the book of Colossians. If you've got your Bibles with you, be opening up today to Colossians chapter 2. Yes, we're still in chapter 2 of Colossians, if you've been following along. If you miss any of these, you can go to our website, lakeshorechristian.com, and you can uh, listen to, or if you have the video capability, you can watch these messages as they're posted there. Uh, We also post them on uh, the Facebook page and YouTube sometimes as well, so you can get it one way or another there. We want you to be able to get these messages and be able to follow along with this study. We're going verse by verse, section by section through the book of Colossians in this series. Today we're going to be looking at a section that I, I've entitled this message, Maintain Your Freedom. As you're walking the walk that God wants you to walk, He wants you to be careful to maintain the freedom that you have in Christ. I can remember many, many years ago when our children were little, they came out with uh, some material to help teach children not to not to go with strangers to to be aware of strangers uh one of the books that came out along that time was stranger danger i don't know if any of you ever remember that book or saw that you could share with your kids and teach them not to to allow themselves to go with strangers and i can remember when our son was very small uh we didn't realize that we had watched this special on the news about children being abducted and and things you should do to protect your children And evidently, our son Bobby saw more of it than we thought, and it really took hold in his mind that he was afraid of strangers. And one day, we were in a store, and we got separated. Bobby didn't see us right away, and he started yelling and screaming as loud as he could. And he wasn't that far from us, but he wasn't sure where we were, and he took off running. And one of the store clerks tried to help him and reached out and grabbed him by the arm. Now, a lot of you don't know our son, but even as a little boy, he was strong and fast. 
And he looked up, and he didn't know that lady, even though she was somebody who worked at the store. And he jerked away from her and took off running again. It took us a long time to catch that boy. (laughs) But we knew right away we had gotten through to him (laughs) to be aware of and not let yourself be taken by a stranger. And, And that reminded me, that's kind of what Paul's talking about with the church in the passage we're going to be looking at today. It's stranger danger. It's the, the danger out there for Christians who are walking along with Christ and they're trying to do all the right things and they're trying to be obedient to everything God tells them to do. But then there are these false teachers out there, these strangers who try to come in and introduce some things to you that aren't really what God wants for you. They're not really in line with God's word or God's will and they could be harmful to you. I got an email this week from one of our members who's going to classes on a college campus And she asked me about this group that was on campus, and they were handing out Bibles and inviting kids to come. I say kids, college-age young adults. They were inviting them. When you get as old as me, everybody's a kid, right? But these young adults on the college campus, they they were trying to get them to come to this Bible study. But she uh, saw the Bibles they were giving out. The name of the group, uh, their program was called Bibles for America. Now, doesn't that sound like a good thing? Bibles for America. I mean, who could argue with the idea that everybody in America ought to have a Bible? And not only that, but they had a special edition of the Bible that they were giving out called the Recovery Bible. Now, doesn't that sound like a great kind of Bible? The Recovery Bible. In fact, people that had any contact with AA or Celebrate Recovery, they might think, well, that's something that they've developed that would be really good to help people who might be struggling with addictions and everything. It's the Recovery Bible. And it all sounded really good. And she actually went to one of the meetings that they had. But there was something about the group that caused her to question whether or not this was a good thing or not. There's just a feeling that she had, a sense that came over her that this might not be the group she ought to connect with. So she shot me an email and asked me if I was familiar with this program, Bibles for America. And I said, you know what, I have heard some things about it that weren't good, but without me just saying that, let me do some research. Let me look a little more. And sure enough, this is a cult group that is going on college campuses all over America, trying to draw young people into their group. And the Recovery Bible is their own edition version of the Bible that, that has all these, in fact, it's got more footnotes than it does scripture in it, which is something you need to look for, all right? It's got more footnotes than actual scripture, and it was all about what they believe, and it was indoctrinating them to become followers of this cult group with the studies that they were doing. Stranger danger. We think maybe it was just back in the time of the early church, but it's very prevalent in our culture today. It is very much out there. That's why it's so important for us as followers of Jesus Christ and our walk to have such a good knowledge of the truth, to understand what God's will and way is, that we'll recognize the falsehoods when they come along. Today we're going to pick up in chapter 2 with verse 13. And we look at uh, the passage is really, the whole section is about the freedom that we have in Christ. But the reason he's emphasizing the freedom is because the thing about freedom is it has to be maintained with some effort. I think our culture forgets that sometimes. They're so anti-war and anti-military that they forget that freedom cost a lot. And it, it required great sacrifice on the part of a lot of people. And in order to maintain and protect that freedom, it may still require that from time to time. The same is true with our spiritual freedom. If we're going to remain free in Christ, it requires some effort on our part, some sacrifice on our part. But in order to to be motivated to do that, we have to recognize how valuable our freedom is, don't we? One of the things sometimes we lose in in one generation to the next is, is that there are some things worth dying for and making sacrifices for. Our freedom is one of those things worth dying for, worth sacrificing for. And our spiritual freedom is worth us making some effort, putting forth some effort, and even being willing to sacrifice for. So he reminds us, first of all, uh, some areas of freedom that we have in Christ so that we'll recognize the value of that freedom, so that we'll be willing to protect it like we should. The first area he talks about in verse 13. Uh, Greg read this earlier. Let's look at it again. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us 
all our sins. The first freedom we have is freedom from death and sin. Freedom from death. Notice he says, he didn't say you were sick in your sins. You were, you were struggling and, and fighting death in your sins. That's not what he says, is it? He says you were what? Dead in your sins. We've got to understand the nature of sin and the consequences of sin is death. Sin is destructive. It kills and destroys. That's why we can't take it lightly. We can never treat sin as if it's our friend that we can welcome into our lives because it comes in to kill and destroy when it comes. But the good news is the freedom that Christ offers us is that we can be Free from sin and its consequences, which is the wages of sin is what? It's death. And yet God in Christ has freed us from that. So, so death is no longer that dark cloud hanging over us all the time like an enemy that has the power to defeat us. That, that, that power to defeat us has been removed by what Jesus did on the cross. There's freedom there. Now we don't have to be afraid. The Bible talks about what can mere mortal man do to me? The worst it could do is kill me. And even then, in Christ, I have victory over death. Amen? So in Christ, we are free from that fear of death. It doesn't mean we welcome death. It doesn't mean we celebrate when somebody dies. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the fact that death does not conquer us, and we know that. Death does strike a blow. When you lose someone that you love or that you care about, you miss them. It hurts not to have them around you right now. But death has not won that battle. I know we just say this trying to explain sometimes what happened when somebody died. They say they lost their battle with cancer. And I understand what they're saying. That physical body was defeated by cancer. But you are more than that physical body. You are a living soul that is eternal. And cancer can never take that from you. Neither can anything else that would bring death to your body. We are freed from that. In Christ. So we need to recognize the value of the freedom from death that we have in Jesus Christ. He has made us alive where? With Christ. Remember last week we talked about how to move from being outside of Christ to being in Christ. We, in faith, are baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death, into his resurrection, so that we can have a new life. And in that new life, we are freed from the power of sin and death. What a wonderful freedom to celebrate in Christ. Amen. Well, there's another freedom that he talks about in verse 14. Let's look at that verse. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. We are also free from the law. We are free from the law. He, saw, he says here that uh, we are, uh, the, he's canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. That requires a law. In order to have a legal indebtedness, there has to be a law established which you have broken that you now owe a debt to. And according to the law, God's law, you look at the covenant he made with Israel, you read through his law. We've done this before here at Lakeshore. If you just take the Ten Commandments part of the law and go through that list, and I would ask you to raise your hand if you've kept all those commandments perfectly all the time, not one hand would be up in this audience. Not one has kept the law of God perfectly. And because of that, we are indebted to the law. The wages of sin of breaking the law is death don't ever ever be tempted to go back to trying to think you can be justified by the law none of us can be justified by the law not a one of us it's good to try to live a good way and make good choices and follow God's teachings all of that is the right thing to do but don't ever think you're going to be justified by following the law because here's the thing about the law. You don't have to break it all to be guilty. How much of it do you have to break? Just any little part of it. And you're guilty of breaking the law. Any little part of it. You're guilty of breaking the law. The good news is, in Christ, he nailed that law to the cross. The law required payment for sin. Be thankful 
that we're not under the old law anymore. Because under the old law, there was never actual forgiveness of sins. There were animal sacrifices that had to be offered over and over and over again, year after year. Uh, at different times during the year, different sacrifices had to be offered according to the law. And none of it ever removed your sins. Ever. It was a temporary payment to give you a little more time until the next sacrifice was made. That's all it was. It never removed sin. They were living under the law, which meant they were living under the guilt of sin all the time. God gave the law to teach us our need for a Savior. Our need for the perfect payment for our sins. It would be foolish for us to ask God to allow us to go back to the old law, the old way of doing it. Because under that system, we could never have adequate payment for our sins. And some of these Christians were being tempted by Jewish believers... Some of the Jewish believers were being tempted by Jews who had not become Christians to think they were better off under the law and the system of the law. And Paul is wanting them to know there's a greater freedom under the new covenant than you could ever have had under the law. No longer is perfection required. Now that's a good thing for you and it's a good thing for me, right? Perfection is not required to be justified. Because I'm not perfect. Have you noticed? (laughs) And neither are you. I've noticed. We, we're not ever going to meet the standard of God's law. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to live a good, righteous life. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you can't be saved that way. You can't. So we need something that can cancel the charge. of our legal indebtedness I've said it before I'll say it again I'll say it the rest of my ministry don't ever ask God to give you what you deserve ever because what you deserve is what I deserve I deserve eternal punishment in hell that's what I deserve and so do you you've sinned and that's the payment for sin You've separated yourself from God because of your sin. The only thing that can bridge that, bring us back, is to have absolute perfect payment in full made for your sin. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. So on the cross, he nailed the law. And the indebtedness we owed to the law, he nailed that to the cross. He's removed that now so that we're not held to that anymore. And I'm thankful for that freedom. He has made a new... That's why when Jesus instituted what we just partook of, the Lord's Supper, when he took the cup and he gave it to them, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The new covenant is so far superior to the old covenant. Under the old covenant, we're all owing a debt to the law. But under the new covenant, the payment has been made in full through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we are free from the law and the punishment, the indebtedness that we had under the law in Christ. The third thing we see here is found in verse 15. It says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We are also free from demonic powers, from all powers that would try to control us and enslave us. We are free in Christ. Satan, more than anything else, wanted to destroy the work of Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the desert to be tempted by Satan? And out there, Satan tried to craft as best he could, the greatest temptations he could put before Jesus. He wanted Jesus to fall. He wanted him to just slip up once, to just make one mistake, to just go against the will of the Father one time because all it would take is one time and he could never pay the price for our sins because he would have sin of his own. More than anything, he wanted to destroy the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he crafted a plan to work through the Jews and the Gentiles, 
to use both groups. Some people always say, you know, they don't like the movies that just show that the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. So they, the, the Gentiles, the Romans don't like the movies that show the, the Gentiles were responsible for the death of Christ. The fact is they all were, and so were we, right? We might as well get our pride out of the way and say, yeah, we did that. But Satan used both the Jews and the Gentiles through the Roman government to craft a plan to take Jesus and beat him and nail him to a cross. He thought, surely that's the best chance I've got to kill Jesus and I could destroy his work that he was trying to accomplish here, the will of the Father. But when Jesus rose from the dead, when he came forth from the grave, he disarmed all power and authority that tried to do anything against him and the Father's will for his life and ministry. He conquered it all by the resurrection from the dead. There is a, a great word picture here in this verse. It says, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Here's the cool thing. This was something the Roman government did. When their military won a victory, or they were all fighting somewhere, and they won this big victory over an enemy. You know what they did? They took captive the leaders of the enemy forces, and they would come back to town and have a victory parade. And in that parade, they would have chained together their captives that they had taken from their enemy, especially their leaders, their military leaders. They would parade them through the street in chains saying, we now have taken them captive instead of them taking us captive. Well, Paul says Jesus turns the tables. He's taken all of those powers all of those authorities captive. And in his death, burial, and resurrection, they are now on parade as spectacles of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has the ultimate victory over all powers and all authorities. I think we as Christians sometimes forget that. We get so upset about, well, my guy didn't get elected or my guy, uh, my, my legislation didn't get passed or, or things seem to be out of control and I don't, want, I don't like the way things are going. We forget that God has power over all of that. It doesn't mean it's his will that all of that happens. It means that he still can have victory over whatever happens. We sometimes don't give God the credit for the power that he has at work in the world today. And it causes us to lose hope and to get all frustrated and upset about every little thing going on out there. And we forget that he has, triumphed, he has uh, victory. He has triumphed over all of them by the cross, by the power of the resurrection. He is going to have the ultimate victory parade when he comes back to get us. Amen. When he comes back this time, it won't be a little baby in the manger. <laughs> It'll be the reigning Lord of all lords and king of all kings. He will have the ultimate victory parade. And our position in Christ will allow us to be on the victorious side of that parade. But if we're outside of Christ, we'll be the spectacle of those that were defeated by Christ and his power. So we are free from all demonic powers, all powers at work in the world today. We're also, the fourth thing here, is found in verses 16 and 17. Two things. We are free from judgment over dietary laws and special days. Look at what he says. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Wow. Part of what was happening in the church then was some of these Christians, especially the Gentile Christians, were being told by the Jewish Christians in particular that they still had to follow the laws. Especially things like the dietary laws and the laws restricting what you could do on the Sabbath or not do on the Sabbath. That they were still bound to those laws, even though they were now in Christ. And there was this new covenant that had come through him. There's still churches around today, groups of Christians around today, trying to tell us the same thing. And if you don't believe it, you may have even been a part of it. You may have even participated in it and not realized it up to this point. 
most of it has been just through tradition that has been passed down through a lot of churches and a lot of ways that we were brought up in different churches. He says, don't let anybody judge you by what you eat or drink. If you look back in Leviticus 11 and other passages, there were some very strict dietary laws for the Jewish people. Now, I think there are many reasons for God to give them those laws, but the main reason was to set them apart from the other cultures around them. You see, they were called to be a distinctively set-apart people. You remember when Daniel and his friends were taken captive and the king tried to get them to eat his diet, eat his food, and they were going to see, you know, if they were raised the way he wanted them to be raised, that they would turn out to be great leaders for the king and great servants for the king. And Daniel said, well, let me follow God's laws instead. Let me do it God's way instead. And let's compare. Let's have a little contest to see who comes out better. And, of course, Daniel and his friends came out better following God's dietary laws. So there was value to God's dietary laws, not just for setting them apart, but also, I believe, it's one of the healthiest ways to eat. But here's the thing. They were under the old covenant. And once you are free from the law as a whole, then that means you're also free from those dietary restrictions that were under the old covenant. Um, There's a great passage in Mark chapter 7 when Jesus was teaching. It says, beginning with verse 17, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. I love Jesus' response in verse 18. Are you so dull? (laughs) In other words, you're not the sharpest tack in the box, are you? You should have caught this by now. All right. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile him? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. And saying this, Jesus declared all foods, what? Clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. In other words, it's not what you eat or don't eat that makes you a righteous person. It's not based on your diet, what you eat or don't eat. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to eat healthier. I'm all for eating healthier. I try to do that myself. And I think we can learn a lot from the old laws, uh, dietary laws in the Old Testament about some things that are good for us and some things that are not good for us. I think there's some good instruction there. But we are not bound to that in our spiritual lives. It doesn't make us any more or less right with God if we eat certain things or don't eat certain things or drink certain things, or don't drink certain things. That's not what makes us right with God. We need to remember that. Now, there's some other good reasons not to eat or drink certain things, but it's not to make us right with God anymore. That's not, we're not under that anymore. That's not binding us anymore. We're free from that now as followers of Jesus Christ. But now, again, there's some other good reasons to eat healthy and do some good things there. Restrict yourself from some things that could be harmful to you. But that's your choice to do that now. You're not bound to that by the law of God. He says also not only the dietary laws, but he says special days as well, uh, including the Sabbath day. In the Old Testament law, there were six major feasts. There were other instructions, too, about different things. But there were six major feasts that they were to follow and do certain things. One of them was the Passover feast, things like that. But he says these things were all a shadow of what was coming. Now, which is better, the real thing or the shadow? The real thing. I'll give you an illustration. Let's say that you're engaged to be married. And you and your fiancé have been separated for a while. But you've got a picture of your fiancé in your apartment. And every day you look at that picture and you just wish you could be together. And you're, you're just so thankful that at least you've got the picture. And you, you just think about how wonderful it's going to be when you're together. And it's wonderful to have that picture there as that reminder. But let's say one day your surprise is that you've been separated because they've been off on, on work or mission or something or military or something like that. But then there's a surprise. Your doorbell rings and you open the door and there's your fiance. What do you do? You run back over and grab the picture and say, oh, this is so great. <laughs> I just love this picture, just the best picture of my fiance. It's just, I love having this picture. No, you wouldn't do that, would you? The real thing's better, isn't it? That's what we've got to learn about the old law. All of that stuff was a shadow. It was a foreshadowing of something superior that was coming. Something better than what was there before. That's what the whole Old Testament is all about. It is a foreshadowing 
of the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan that came through Jesus Christ. So much better to have the real thing. That's why I'm still amazed at how many people think, oh, we've got to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Really? That was a shadow. That was, for, that was picturing something that was better that was coming in the future. That's all the temple was. Worship in the temple was all about something superior to that that was going to come. That's one thing a lot of the Jews didn't get. That's why they rejected Christ. They still wanted to go back to the old thing instead of the better thing. When the fulfillment comes, you don't go back to the shadow anymore. You grab hold to the fulfillment. You find your hope there. The Bible says our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Where does God dwell today? He dwells in his temple today, but his temple today is you and me. That's far superior to some building somewhere where the presence of God is. Think about that. How much better it is to actually have God in you instead of in a room in the temple somewhere. In the Holy of Holies where he was in the temple. We need to understand the value, the superiority of the fulfillment of what those things were foreshadowing that were yet to come. And not try to go back to the old things because they're inferior to the fulfillment of those things. It's like the Sabbath day. How many of you were raised where Sunday is the Sabbath day? Yeah, a lot of you were. Guess what? That's not true. What day was the Sabbath day? Saturday. Saturday was the Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath day, they had these laws and restrictions on what they could or could not do on the Sabbath day. Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the last day of the week. In creation, God rested on which day? The seventh day, the Sabbath day. That's the last day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. Jesus Christ rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. The early church began to meet and remember that on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. But Sunday is never called the Sabbath day, ever, anywhere in Scripture. It is never said to be the equivalent to the Sabbath day, anywhere in Scripture. That was a tradition that developed over the years in the church. Nothing evil about it. It's just a tradition, though. Now, The idea of Sabbath rest is taught in Scripture, but the Sabbath rest has in Scripture been revealed to be the ultimate fulfillment of that. It's when Christ comes back and we all enter into an ongoing Sabbath rest in the presence of God. Now, I still like having a day off. I'm all for that. I love having, I think having a day of rest is a principle taught in Scripture that's a great thing to have. Guess what? I don't get to take Sundays off. I've been talking to the other elders, working on it, and somehow it just doesn't work for me to take Sundays off. So I would never get a Sabbath if it had to be on Sunday, would it? I take Monday as my Sabbath because Sabbath means rest before God. So I take Monday as my Sabbath. Why? Because any day of rest is a day of rest. We're not bound to an old law that said it had to be Saturday. The old law was nailed to the cross. Can you wash your car on Sunday? Oh, no. There's no restriction under the new covenant that says you can't wash your car on Sunday. You may work every other day of the week. That may be the only day you can wash your car. I'm okay if you wash your car on Sunday, but don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That is taught in the New Testament. Do you need to get some rest away from work? Absolutely. I would encourage you to put that in your schedule, whether it's Sunday or Saturday or whatever day you do it. It's a good thing. But don't restrict it to the Sunday being like the Sabbath day. It's not anywhere in the New Covenant that Sunday is the Sabbath day. It is a day that we should honor God by fulfilling that command to assemble together, to worship together corporately as the church. That is taught under the New Covenant. But Saturday is the Sabbath day under the old law, not Sunday. Could you actually even worship on another day other than Sunday? Sure you can. It doesn't mean you should forsake the assembly on Sunday, but of course you could still assemble for some other things and worship on other days. Could you take communion on another day other than Sunday? Absolutely. No reason in the world why you couldn't take it on another day. As long as you take it the right way according to the scriptures and remember what it's supposed to be remembering when you do it, honoring and remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It doesn't have to just be on a Sunday. Remember, the old law was nailed to the cross. We're under a superior covenant with Christ. Now, I'm all for 
still honoring God on Sunday in every way that we can. But let's remember that the Sabbath day was just a foreshadowing of the ultimate fulfillment of something better that was coming, which is our ongoing Sabbath with God in eternity. Well, we're also, the fifth thing here is found in verses 18 and 19. We are free from new age philosophies. He says, don't let anyone who delights in false humility and worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. and They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. You know what was beginning to happen? There were these followers of Christ originally followers of Christ, that developed Gnosticism. We've talked about it over the last few weeks. And the Gnostics were saying, oh, the revelation that God gave to the apostles was pretty good, but we now have been given even newer revelation than that. We've had dreams and seen visions, and we, we've had the, uh, our own angels come and talk to us and reveal things to us and give us new revelations here now to follow. And it's far superior to the old one that, that came through the apostles. And so they were saying that these new philosophies were better and they should, if they were really wanting to grow spiritually, they they would leave that old teaching from the apostles behind and follow after this new age of revelation and teaching that had come. Sounds a lot like the founder of the Mormon religion who had the angel Moroni come and reveal to him a whole new other testament of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? It's exactly what the Mormons claim. That's how they were founded. That's how they got the Book of Mormon. The problem with that is the apostles clearly taught, if anybody comes to you with any other gospel than the one we preach to you, let them be cursed. The book of Revelation ends by telling us, if anybody adds to this book or takes away from this book, all the curses in this book will be added to that person. We are not supposed to be adding anything to the revelation we have in God's Word or taking anything away from the revelation that we have in God's Word. God's Word is sufficient. It is all we need for our walk and our life here is to follow the teachings of God's Word. In fact, he tells us to test the spirits in Scripture, not to be gullible, not to just accept whatever teachers are out there telling us all the time. I, uh, I, I get a kick out of watching shows on television where they, they have these guests come on that say, great new diet for everybody to follow. And they have people that come on and say, great new health discovery for everybody. You need to start doing this. You need to start drinking this or eating this or doing that. Or, or work. this is the new workout that we know is now is better for you than the old way of working out. And, and they come on shows like Oprah and Dr. Oz and all those shows. Here's the problem. If you watch for about five weeks, you're going to find two shows that contradict each other totally. That's all it's going to take. Where what was said on this show doesn't match up with what was said on this show. There's always a new one. There's always a new one. There's always a new one. We can, we're so gullible sometimes. We can't just accept the fact that if you really want to be healthy, you should eat right and exercise. That's, that's, it's that simple. Get enough rest, eat right, and exercise. That, that's the key. We're not satisfied. That's not enough. Give me more. Give me something. Give me some 12-step plan I got to follow to make it okay. Where I, I'm going to be just where I need to be all the time. Even in our spiritual lives, we come to church, and and if you go to a church like this that preaches the gospel clearly and it's easy to understand, sometimes you start thinking, oh, that's not deep enough. I need to go deeper. You're already over your heads, people. (laughs) So am I. This stuff is bigger than me. It's over my head, too. Of course, we should try to grow and learn all we can learn, but, but the Scripture itself, listen to what, uh, what the Paul said to Timothy about the Scripture in, verse, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible has all you need for all time, for all that God intends for your life, period. There is nothing deeper than that. That's as deep as it gets, and that's deeper than you and I could ever swim in without the help of God. We need to understand, let's stop reaching out there for some greater new revelation. We've got all the revelation we need right here in God's Word. We can't even follow it the way we should. Why are we looking for something else? 
let's focus on the thing that God says is the complete revelation we need for our lives. It tells us how to walk, how to live for the whole time that we live here on this earth. We don't need to add anything to it or leave anything out of it. Well, there's a sixth one. We're also free from man-made restrictions. Look at verse 20 to 23. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence I love it when we try to make up rules as if God didn't give us enough well God I'm going to help you out I'm going to clarify and give more details to what you've already revealed to us here I can remember as a young preacher, I, was start, I had never been to church camp before, but I started working in church camps. Growing up, I didn't ever go to church camp, but, but I started working in church camp. And one church camp that I worked at, we had this dean one year who had all these rules for the campers. Just strict rules about... about what they could or could not do at camp. And one of the rules was girls' shorts had to be no more than three inches above their knees. Now, that sounds like uh, that's a great idea. We have modesty at camp, right? Got to be modest at camp, three, three inches above the knee. And they, he just thought that was going to make camp better. You know what the boys were doing all week long at camp? Let me measure that to see if it's three inches or more. <laughs> they saw it as a great excuse to reach out and touch a girl's leg and measure whether or not those shorts were three inches or not. It didn't, it, it didn't curb sec- that, that, that drive that they had to want to touch the girls at all. In fact, it increased it a lot. The whole week of camp, I had to say, get your hands off of her all week long. It was ridiculous. I was made deed of a week of camp. You know what I said? We expect you to dress modestly at camp. That's what the scripture says. If we think you're wearing something inappropriate, we'll call you off to the side privately and ask you to change. Never had any problem all week long. You don't have to make up a whole bunch of rules that God doesn't make up. Modesty is modesty. We all understand modesty. Let's just follow the rule of modesty that God does give us instead of trying to add to it all these man-made rules. We all know churches have added man-made rules throughout the ages. We've all added stuff. Like, for example, some people think there's a group out there that people go visit, and they think they're so holy and so great, the Amish, right? Now, I may offend some of you. That's okay. I've done that before. (laughs) I'm okay with that because I get offended too sometimes. Here's the thing. We think, oh, it's so great, the Amish. They, They don't do this. They don't do that. Do you understand the group that, that, as far as any criminal records we can get a hold of, report. The highest numbers of incest among any group in America is among the Amish. All of those rules they're trying to live by do not stop that inward evil that grows in the heart of man. It does not. Let's stop thinking they're holy because they don't do this and don't do that. It's not about the rules that man has made up. That's not what makes us holy. We think, of the, think about this. The Catholic priest can't marry, right? We think that, that's to keep them holy and married to God. You know what's happened with the Catholic priest. It did not stop them from having problems with fleshly, sensual indulgence, did it? Not at all. That rule does not stop that. It's surrendering your heart to God that stops that. So let's stop making rules about dancing and movies. Some of you, we've got Easter coming up. Some of you will choose to, at Lent, give up something for Lent. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing evil about that. Is that required under the new covenant in any way? Absolutely not. Some people practice fasting. Is it okay to fast? Absolutely. It's a good spiritual discipline. Are we commanded to fast in the new covenant? Absolutely not. I practice it sometimes, but it's not because I'm commanded to, that I think I have to do that to be righteous before God. And it doesn't make me any more spiritual than somebody who doesn't fast, by the way, because fasting is not required in our relationship with God. 
You see, we've got to stop making human rules as if they are equal to what God actually says about those things. We've even made the environment today almost holy, haven't we? Whatever you do, you can't do anything to hurt the environment. Don't ever do anything to hurt the environment. And, and I understand we have a responsibility to manage the, the world that God gave us. I'm all for being good managers of what God's given us. Here's the thing you don't understand. Is, is groups always take things like that to the extreme, and they make rules that don't, don't even have common sense to them. For example, you think you're saving trees when you recycle paper. You are not. We have more trees being grown now for the production of paper than we have in over 50 years now. You don't save a tree when you recycle paper. You may save some space in the landfill, but you don't save a tree. They are now harvesting trees and replanting trees in such a cycle now, the, the ones we grow for paper, that they will never run out of trees as long as they keep doing that. Not the trees for paper. Now, there's some other trees that are in greater danger, but not the trees they use for paper. But you don't know that, do you? Because the public, the, the, the news media won't report it that way. They just sell you paper because they say it's recycled paper. We could charge more, and you think you're helping the environment when you buy it. I've got people that work in the pulpwood industry in Georgia that I know that are friends of mine. They don't want you doing that. They want to keep selling more paper, trees for paper, because they've got plenty of them to sell. And they can make more. They grow in about 20 years. That's all it takes to replace those trees that they use for paper. But you see, we've made the environment our God. You can't possibly cut trees and be okay with the environment. Yes, you can, as long as you're replanting trees. It doesn't hurt the environment in any way whatsoever. It's the Alaska oil pipeline, I was in Alaska. We went to an area where the Alaska oil pipeline was coming through. They want to put the pipeline in because the wildlife would be destroyed if you put in a pipeline. You know what the moose learned to do? Walk around and under the pipeline. <laughs> it's amazing how intelligent they were. And all the other animals there, they learned to, to go around the pipeline. Some of them even made nests and homes in the pipeline. That's how dangerous it was. Hasn't hurt the environment at all. Not even a little bit. You see, we let ourselves be gullible with all these man-made restrictions and rules that God doesn't give us. We've got to be smarter than that. Let's protect the environment but use common sense. I want to close with this. Three principles that you need to follow as our praise team gets ready. Number one, you are free in Christ, so you should enjoy it. Enjoy the freedom that you have in Christ. It's a wonderful thing to be free from sin and death, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing to be free from the law because we would be condemned otherwise. It's a wonderful thing to be freed from man-made rules and traditions. That's great. We should enjoy that and not be bound by that. The first thing is you're free in Christ. Enjoy it. The second thing is you're free in Christ, but don't flaunt it. Let's not act like our freedom means that we, we should uh, expect everybody else to understand it and, and follow it the way we do. There are people who, who don't, in good conscience, feel like they can do something on Sunday. Okay, they shouldn't do it if they can't do it in good conscience. Don't flaunt your freedom, though, by saying, you're an idiot. Why don't you go wash your car on Sunday? That's not a Christian way to handle it. <laughs> right? Let's not flaunt our freedom in Christ. But there's a third thing, too. You're free in Christ. Don't abuse it, either. In 1 Corinthians 10, 23, it says this, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. I've got a right to eat anything. God made all things clean. Does that mean I should have a diet of donuts every day? Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry, Rose. <laughs> Sorry, that's not it. You tried. Of course you've got freedom in Christ. But he says don't use your freedom as an excuse for sin. Don't do anything to hurt others. Don't do anything to destroy your witness. Don't abuse your freedom that you have in Christ. Friends, if you're here today and you, you're ready to be free from sin and the law, you're ready to be free from death, you want to walk in the freedom that Christ has for you today it's made possible not by following this set of rules not by, by, by meeting every standard that God set out there you can't do it that way you must receive the payment that was made for you that Jesus made for you on the cross the way you receive that is coming in faith professing what you believe about Jesus being baptized into Christ ready to walk into that new position of being in Christ living a new life free in Christ. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come.